What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Producing in a Pandemic, where we talk about tools and resources for artists and creatives. I'm your host, William Thompson, and in today's episode, I'm excited to present an interview that I did uh, with my friend and my brother, Tony A. Um, Tony is an artist, a recording artist uh, based out of Baltimore, Maryland. I actually met him several years ago uh, when I was a student at Morgan State University, at the Morgan State University. Uh, And uh, he's always been a source of support and encouragement um, for me. Uh, But uh, I've seen um, him grow and seen him uh, develop into uh, the artist uh, that he is. Uh, So I was very excited to be able to have him um, on this episode, um, on uh, this podcast. Um, This is another interview that's going to be broken up into several parts. Um, So this is going to be part one. Um, But I'm excited to share with you all my conversation, um, Artist Talk with Tony A. Go ahead and check it out. I'm excited to have my friend, uh, my brother. Um, uh, he is just someone who really became second family uh, to me as I was uh, coming into adulthood, as I was coming into my own as a person, as a man, as an artist uh, in so many different areas. Uh, but I'm excited to have my friend and my brother, um, Tony A, on the podcast today. Um, he is um, an independent um, artist based in Baltimore. Um, known him for several years, and uh, we're going to just talk about his uh, journey, how he um, got into music, how he uh, transitioned from, you know, um, from various uh, different stages. He's done a lot of different things. Um, He's probably one of the busiest people I know, Um, but he's done a lot of different things, and uh, we're going to basically just talk about uh, the uh, different stages of music and artistry that he's gone in, gone through, and uh, just see where he's at now and see how he was able to, um, even with the pandemic, still be productive, still, um, you know, make music as well as create other opportunities for other people. So um, welcome to the stage, Tony A. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Tony, thanks so much uh, for uh, doing this. Uh, I want to say for everyone, um, I, w- I really appreciate you just as a person. Um, I think there are a few people that I can count on that have been um, consistently supportive, um, encouraging, um, even uh, even though we're not geographically in the same place anymore. Um, you know, I, the support is still there. The love is still there. I greatly appreciate it. Um, I wanted to just say that first and foremost before we even get into any questions or anything like that. Just a thanks to you. Oh, man, I appreciate it. Um, I'm so proud to be here. I'm super excited that you asked me. I, uh, I love supporting everything that you do. Just I've been seeing your journey, just even going through the pandemic, like building your stuff, honing your craft, like building and growing and putting out your music and working on your project. So like appreciate iron that. sharpens iron. So like yeah, exactly. <laughs> same right back to you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, so let's go ahead and get into this first and foremost. I, and granted, I know a lot of this information just because we're we're friends. We've we've been we know each other for years at this point. Um, but um, for those who don't know you, for those who have not been following you, who are maybe getting introduced to you, ooh, let's fix that mic. Uh, for those who may be getting introduced to you um, through today's episode. Um, how did you kind of get started with music? Let's let's start with, you know, your journey, how you got into it. Sure. Well, I guess music has always been a part of my life on some level, like probably like most people who end up in music, like listen to it at church, heard it around the house. Um, I always grew up listening to a plethora of styles of music. So I was never one of those people that grew up like feeling like you had to just do one type. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. But then just lucky, I guess, I, I ended up uh, going to school for, for music from what, like middle school all the way up through college. Like I was lucky enough to get exposed to some amazing people, amazing talent. Um, when I moved out to the East Coast, because I started in New Mexico, which is where I got introduced and was more like show tunes, classic, concert choir, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um, then later when I moved to the East Coast, I introduced to this wonderful thing called gospel music. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, got connected through my home church there and through my school. Got started singing backgrounds for different gospel artists and at different gospel events. And then went to Morgan State and studied music there. And the rest is kind of history. It's just like every time I got an opportunity to grab something, I just did. <laughs> yes, yes. And like, like I said, I'm privy to this. There's so much... I think when you look at your, I'm, I'm also, I can say that when you look at your musical history and journey, everything that you have done since then just kind of makes sense. Um, and I guess I would say this as a point to the people, it's important to be true to who you are as an artist. Um, I think oftentimes we're so caught up in people's expectations of us. Um, I know some people that, you know, they did gospel music because, well, you know, I, I always kind of did gospel music or I was expected to do gospel music, but then they transitioned into another genre. And it's like, oh, well, this is actually a really a great fit for you. I know we have one friend in particular who comes to mind who, you know, he transitioned into R&B and I was like, oh, wow. Like I didn't hear it at first because I'd always seen him do gospel. But yeah. when I saw him do r and I was like, Oh, this is perfect for you. Yeah. This is where you should have been the whole time. It's hard to imagine him as anything else. Actually, I was just talking to somebody about it, like not to give him shout outs and props. Well, he's not here, but mm-hmm. check out Marlo, y'all. He's amazing. Yeah. Maybe we'll get him on the podcast. Maybe we'll get him on the yeah, podcast. Absolutely. Soon. But no, like that's that's so true. Like you don't realize, you don't realize like how capable someone is sometimes until they just really embrace what they do best. And like, we hear that all the time as musicians, right? Like be true to yourself, be an artist, don't be afraid of that. But everything in our world is tailored to the opposite of that. <laughs> it's like mm-hmm. inform, stay in these boundaries if you want success. So I definitely think that once, uh, like finding your own sense of success and then staying true to that is so important as a creative. Yeah, yeah. So as we, you know, look through your journey, you started, started in New Mexico, wound up from New Mexico, um, on the East Coast uh, in Maryland, um, and there got exposed to gospel and stuff like that. And then you mentioned landing at Morgan State University, uh, and that's where I met you. I met my my our journey <laughs> connected at Morgan State. Um, but at Morgan State, you you did this thing. Um, what was it called? Uh, Voices of Praise. Just a just a little just a little just a little a little a little a little small thing that that happened. Um, Get, can you give some just some insight in that? Because like I said, it all it all comes together and all kind of kind of formed like the building blocks of where you are now as an yeah. artist. Yeah, for sure. Um, Voices of Praise was a, a wonderful accident that grew into something amazing. Um, Voices of Praise, that choir came up because in my freshman year as a music major, um, there were little pecking orders and crazy stuff, so not a lot of practice rooms. And so as a new freshman, a new vocal performance major, um, you were getting all the training and education, but you weren't getting all the like optimal, like first choice shots at the platforms, right? To actually utilize it. And because of my experience, I knew that like, it's one thing to like be equipped with something like book smarts, but it's another thing to be able to apply that. And so I was always looking for ways to apply the skills that I was doing. And one time during homecoming, we went and got to be a part of a service uh, with MSU choir. And at the end of the service, the pastor at the time, Reverend Pauline Wilkins was just like, wow, this is beautiful. Like music enhances the experience here at the chapel. And they were just like, I wish we could have this every Sunday. And we were just like, why don't you have this every Sunday? Like it's church, like thinking, like coming from yeah. like home to college, you're like, it's church, there should be music, right? Uh, <laughs> if only things were that simple. But um, they hadn't had anything. They only saw music once a year, um, sometimes maybe two times when Morgan State would go over there. And so we were like, hey, we're a bunch of freshmen. We're studying, we're growing, we're not perfect. Um, but if you're willing to just let us come and practice here whenever, like." we'll come and sing when we can. And we did, we said, we sang when we could, it was not all the time. Uh, we were normal college students making college choices. So there were some mornings <laughs> where you place the phone call to everybody and be like, hey, we going to church this morning. It was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when we were there, um, we performed uh, and we ended up growing. And 
by the next year, we got asked to be there full time at the chapel. And then eventually I got hired as the music director there to like be able to continue, which was weird because I had to go from just being like Tony to Mr. Avery kind of. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also cool because kind of like to what you were saying, we first started out again, we were just 12 freshmen. So we had no skills at playing any instruments. We were just singers. So we were acapella forever and we didn't have a sound system there. So we were always like trying to find ways to like sing and not blow out our voices, which was crazy. Cause by the time we got a mic system, we realized we were so used to performing acapella with no sound system that we had actually grown in our vo vocal skills. And we had like voices three times the size of what we thought it was. So we became known for having like this huge, right gospel sound and it was cool it was fun seven years that we spent yeah. doing that and oh my gosh it was the it trips was. the travels the retreats the the all i think of all the musicians that came out of that and it's crazy mm -hmm. um how many people are like still doing music and stuff and i i just think like if they hadn't had that space right to go and like learn and grow where would they be right now like <laughs> I can I can definitely vouch as one of those people um, uh, that that it was uh, it was a necessary uh, for me I could say it was a necessary place for me to be at the time I think uh, that you know it just the timing of everything um, I was I was blessed to have been able to go there when I did um, and try not I try not to make it churchy every once in a while I get a little churchy. We're not a churchy podcast, though. That's going to be another one. <laughs> but um, no, uh, I, 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 I always remember. In fact, I came across the YouTube video that I sent you all. Um, so it's interesting hearing that perspective, because when I when I was, you know, preparing to go to Morgan for my first year, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know any of this history. I was just was like, oh this is a college choir on campus and having auditioned for the band, I was like, well, I must audition for the choir as well. And uh, it was so funny. I sent uh, these two YouTube clips that I made at home, which now that I look back, they were God awful. Oh my gosh, they were horrible. Um, I've grown so much um, in large part to, um, you know, the people that I met at, at, in, at Morgan and through Voices of Praise, but um you know, I remember sending the video and then when I met them in person, they were like, oh, you're the one who sent the video. <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, you, you think this MSU choir, <laughs> you, you think this is something else. And it was just so, it's just so interesting because like being in something and having been in the, um, the infancy of it, you don't understand the impact or even the way it's perceived by other people. Yeah. Um, you, never, you never really understand that. Um, so. I'm I'm glad I was able to be a part when I was. Um, I know a lot of people. Uh, they s formed friendships um, to this day. Um, there's so many so many people that I can think of that they have found their best friends um, in in those choirs. They found relationships in those in in that choir. They um, have really created their own home away from home, second families. Um, people that especially which is really important in a college setting because you have so many people that were not you know from Baltimore even even people from Maryland like someone like myself I was from you know you know from like 45 minutes away um, but still I, I wasn't going home every weekend I wasn't seeing my family all the time you know the Morgan Chapel was my church yeah so um, with that and you know just all the relationships and stuff that were formed everything that was birthed out of that um, you know it just really was such a wonderful um, experience and um, like I said I'm, I know that there are things that you learned just in terms of being um, a leader being an artist being a performing musician as we call it um all of that that was really honed within that time and in that in the space of just those four walls that were in the chapel i mean yeah and i mean like in hindsight i think about it i don't think i would have grown as much as i did as an artist if i didn't have that like you're talking about we did what 
four songs, new songs a week mm -hmm. for seven years, probably saw well over 200 members come through. So I had to learn 200 different artist styles. Like I, I think about it all the time, how Voice of Praise kind of, if you look at everything that I do now, all of that framework was started during that time, but I didn't know it. I was just mm -hmm. kind of doing my part. You know, even I was one of the founders, but me becoming director, I was voted to be director. So mm -hmm. it was just like, everything was happenstance. It was never, it was, it was never an intentional thing, which is kind of how music is, right? Like you don't wake up and like, yeah, I mean, some of us do, but like, mm -hmm. you don't wake a up. Lot, like, a lot of times it's just a matter of inspiration, just what comes, what hits you. Yeah, like when you talk to artists about their process and like, we've had these conversations about like the random things that just cause us to like find our muse and like start mm -hmm. creating or start putting something together in a vision. And I think one thing that I've always had is this understanding that time is not mine to control. Mm -hmm. And so like, I tell people all the time, I don't necessarily always think that I'm the most talented, but I do think that I am have some of the best nerve um, and it do take nerve <laughs> to be able to put yourself out there and essentially say, yeah, I, I know I'm not the best, but why does that have to stop me from doing what I'm doing? And I, I feel like in doing that, I became the best at what I do, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. It makes total yeah. sense. Um, yeah, no, that that's that's really it's really good. Um, so moving on through the journey, we go we're gonna make our way to the present soon. Um, but before before we get to Tony A, we had Anthony Avery and Eclectic. Yes. <laughs> so um I was I was fortunate to be one of one of the members for for a time. Um, I was I tried to stay the drummer. Then next thing I knew, they handed me a microphone. I don't know what happened. Um <laughs> I was, I said, I'm, I'm gonna just play drums. I was trying to, you know, trying to, you know, relive or just kind of live out the, the last of my glory days as a drummer. Um, but Anthony Avery and Eclectic is when we really kind of start to see um, a transition from, you know, the gospel choir influences. Um, not that they disappeared, but it's just that there was in there's incorporation of some of those other styles yeah uh, and we see how um you know it branched out from you know gospel contemporary gospel to some pop pop um you know rock influence in some of the songs that came out even some of the arrangements even in terms of the coverage and things like that um let's talk about that really quickly that it wasn't a long season um, but it was a season of your life in terms of Anthony Avery and Eclectic. How did you, one, how did you make the the decision to transition from Voices of Praise to, you know, Anthony Avery? Uh, I think it was honestly one of the hardest decisions that I made because I'm one of those people, like, I enjoy my comforts. Mm -hmm. And, like, I feel like I could have stayed there and kept doing Voices of Praise for years to come and, and been good. But on a career-wise, um, it it wasn't changing anything and i'm not even talking about like being famous or like winning grammys or anything like that it just wasn't growing and i don't believe in being any place that i'm not growing or learning i've always been taught to value education i've always been taught to value transition and transformation and so it was like i have reached kind of like the pinnacle of what i could do um and i felt myself getting stale i felt myself getting repetitive so it was just like maybe it's happening because you're not being true to what it is. In that case, looking at it from a gospel perspective, I prayed and I was just like, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. And in the end, it was just like, no, like, I gave you all these stories. I gave you all these experiences to share gospel to those who you can reach. And um, that was kind of the, the whole idea behind the transition. Like, and and me believing that I could do it because I was I kind of got uncomfortable like being the director right being yeah. the behind the scenes like I don't want the solos I don't want the not valuing my voice not valuing what I brought to the table and um, I always say that like not to get too overly religious but like I always say that God has a sense of humor and mm -hmm. sometimes like when you're feeling uncomfortable and you have that moment where you like clap back and you're like well like 
I could do this stuff if you give me the chance, like sometimes God does. And then you're sitting there wide eyed, like, oh, you were serious. <laughs> so the next thing you know, I was a, I was a gospel artist and it was stressful. I had a very hard time because I didn't know who I was and what my sound was. And I think I spent like the first year just really doing stuff of the songs that I enjoyed. Um, and a friend of mine said, uh, the stuff you enjoy listening to is not what you sound the best on. And it's not where you come alive at. And um, the second, I always remember, it was a song called Your Destiny. Um, I can't even think of the artist's name right now. Kevin LeVar. Thank you. Yeah, um, I remember that one. That was the first song that I sang, probably outside of All I Have to Give by Mally Music. Mm -hmm. Those were probably the first two songs that were by art other artists that I sang that I felt like, okay, this is, I'm getting closer to who I am. Like I sang Your Destiny in front of people for the first time and my entire family was just like rocking back and forth. And I just, I just remember uh, my friends looking at me and be like, oh, you could tell who your family was. Cause they were all, y'all were all having the same like worship vibey moment. moment. Yeah. And it was just like, and it was good. Like to, especially moving around a lot and stuff like that, that I kind of, that kind of played a, part in like my loss of musical identity so it was just like good to know that like I have something there and yeah that kind of kicked that off mm -hmm. I think that's a very important point that you're speaking to in terms of you know just knowing yourself as an artist um and knowing the difference between the two because um I think as as an artist especially as as a recording artist it can be very challenging. Sometimes there's stuff that we enjoy listening to, but we're not always able to perform it. You know, Most I, like, <laughs> I, I, I love, like, I like, I like classical music, but I am not an opera singer. <laughs> you know, um, I, uh, I enjoy R and B. I don't per personally, I don't think my voice really has the best texture for it. You know, yeah. some might disagree. I don't know. But I personally don't think I have the the texture for that kind of stuff. It just so happens that I am in a genre singing a style that I think also complements my voice, but I also enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, you know, just because of my personal convictions and things like that, you know, having the relationship with God that I do. Um, but, you know, in addition to that, I could also probably do Broadway. I could, you know, do... Um, you know, musical theater. Like I, I love singing those things. I had someone tell me, you know, oh, you could be like one of the, like the voice actors for a Disney movie. I was like, mm, keep that in mind. You know, maybe I will. Who knows? But uh, you know, sometimes the stuff that we enjoy, we're not always able to perform, at least on that on that level. So we have to really kind of have that tough conversation. You know, it is a conversation I remember my mom had with me once. She asked me is music a hobby or is it a profession mm. and if music is a hobby then you can sing whatever you want because you just be riding in your car and sing whatever you want but if you're talking about going into a studio if you're talking about spending money on recording even if it's even recording time recording equipment if you're doing it at home if you're doing it in the studio whatever it is you know if you're talking about putting that investment into it then you want to make sure that you're getting a good return on that investment. Exactly. And it is a big investment. Right? <laughs> like, <Trust me. laughs> it's, it's literally a huge investment. And like, I think that's, I, if I don't appreciate anything from my time as a gospel artist, like having that space in place to where I really learned like what it means to be a gospel artist was like, like, wow. And be an artist in general. Like, I learned so much of the behind the scenes stuff that I didn't know because I just thought it was about getting up there with a mic and singing. And it's not, that's like the smallest piece of it. Um, but it was cool and I was grateful for it. <laughs> Thank you all so much for tuning into uh, part one of Artist Talk with Tony A. Uh, please tune in next week for part two of our conversation. It's not done. Uh, we're definitely going to get more into his journey and uh, continue our conversation. Uh, but thank you all so much for tuning into part two of this conversation, as well as just another episode of this podcast producing in a pandemic. Uh, if you found value 
in today's conversation, then do me a favor and go ahead and subscribe to our podcast. Follow our podcast. We are available on Apple, Google, and Spotify podcast platforms. Uh, you can also watch episodes uh, every Thursday uh, by going uh, to my YouTube channel, William Thompson Music. Uh, Thank you all so much. And guys, until next time, keep creating. Bye.